All right, so um, welcome to uh, the OpenStack Compute introduction. Uh, I'm Mike Lovell. There's uh, some contact info for me, as well as down here uh, is a link to the slide deck. Um, it's already up there, so you can go pull it down if uh, you have a device with you. Um, one note, I do, compared to my presentation yesterday, I'm using, this is my work email address. Um, I am going to go ahead and put the, the legal disclaimer in there. Um, I do get paid to work on OpenStack Compute, uh, but this presentation is all my own work, uh, not sponsored by the company at all. Uh, anything I say does not necessarily reflect any opinions or product roadmap of the company, so don't, don't take any of it that way. So adaptive computing, computing. is the, the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work for Adaptive Computing. We, just as a side note, we make uh, software for managing supercomputers, and we're we're getting into the the cloud space. So. So, so Mike, the, when you say you get paid to do work on OpenStack, is that a contribution back to the OpenStack? Project? No, it's just in, internal yeah. internal stuff right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, probably sometime this year, the company will actually start doing some external OpenStack stuff, but that stuff I can't comment on. And uh, yeah, like I said, there is to, don't take it as any kind of product roadmaps or any announcements or anything. Nothing, this presentation, nothing to do with the company. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm just some crazy sysadmin. Um, I've been a sysadmin multiple places. I started off at the uh, uh, Harold B. Lee Library at BYU as uh, while I was a student. Um, after I graduated from college, I ended up going to Mosey and uh, being the uh, senior sysadmin in charge of their storage system, which by the time I, well, when I started was about 100 nodes, by the time I left was over 2,000, and went from one petabyte to about 70. So that was a lot of fun. Um, after that, I actually got out of sysadmin work for a little while and had a about a year and a half month stint with adaptive computing as a software engineer. Realized, wait a second, I suck at programming. And um, have since moved in back into systems administration at adaptive uh, in the IT group. And uh, I got started on the, the OpenStack stuff as a, while well, I was a, a software engineer and uh, it's kind of carried over with me into IT. Uh, I've used virtualization a lot over the years, I've used many different systems. Uh, and there's a little bit of an overview of those. So uh, here's what we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk about what is OpenStack and uh, why you should care about OpenStack, um, what Nova is, uh, how everything fits together, how to use it, and what you can do with it. So uh, this is something I yanked right off the OpenStack website uh, for what is OpenStack. Open source software for building private and public clouds. Can we get any more generic? It's actually next slide. Um, which as a side note, something really funny that a few friends point, showed me a couple weeks ago. Uh, someone made a, a Chrome, Google Chrome plugin that uh, will replace all instances of the cloud with my butt. And so now you've got that in your head, and you'll be replacing cloud with bot all through these and laughing. So I, I am perfectly okay with that. So um, but that, that's, that's a pretty generic description. Here's one that's farther in the page. Uh, OpenStack is a cloud operating system that controls large pool of compute storage and networking resources stored throughout the data center, all managed through a dashboard that gives administrators control while empowering their users to provision resources through a web interface. Okay, what the crap is that supposed to mean? That's a little better on describing what OpenStack is. Let's try a picture this time, maybe it'll help a little bit. So here's a really high level view of what OpenStack is. It's uh, you know many components that provide compute, networking, and storage resources uh, on hardware to applications and users so that they can make requests to it. Um, so, but that's all kind of the generic marketing stuff. Here's my opinion. There are actually a few things that you could, you could say OpenStack is. Um, 
First, there's a nonprofit foundation, the OpenStack Foundation. This is, um, I, I guess you could say, the business entity and, and the group driving OpenStack development. They're in charge of, uh, you know, the brand, the direction of the software, all of that. They've got a board of directors. I think it's 21 people on the board, um, elected from multiple different tiers of uh, people contributing uh, to the ecosystem, etc. Um, that's a relatively recent thing. I think it's only been within the last year that they got that going. Uh, you can also think of OpenStack as a collection of software projects, kind of like Eclipse or Apache. Um, on both those, you have a, a, uh, a number of software projects, uh, whether or not they're related to a core project or not. Uh, with Apache, you've got a lot of stuff that's not necessarily related to HTTPD. Um, Eclipse, I actually don't know too much there. I think just about everything goes in with the Eclipse IDE in some way. Um, with OpenStack, everything does kind of relate to each other. Um, they're not just picking up random stuff at the moment. Uh, and so it's got a number of software projects, each of them that provide a different piece of building um, various quote unquote cloud services. Um, so you can see down here, uh, virtual machines, network storage, uh, object storage, all those as a service uh, for people to use. Uh, I, have a question. Yeah? I saw P A A S on the schedule. So um, this is more infrastructure as a service. Um, you could build a PaaS system on top of OpenStack, but they don't have any software projects My directly. Is, what is PaaS? Oh, platform as a service. Yeah. So that think of that as like a software application as a service. Uh, or, or yeah, Heroku is a, a, a perfect example of that. So it's like it's like yeah, they they you, you write like your a Ruby Ruby on Rails app, and they provide some tools to quickly deploy it to their infrastructure. So they run your Ruby's, Ruby on Rails app. So it's kind of the middle ground between infrastructure as a service, like what this is, and then full on just software as a service. It's somewhere in the middle. Most people associate OpenStack, though, with uh, virtual machines, uh, a la uh, Amazon's EC2. So, and that's actually what the rest of the, the talk is going to be in the context of. Uh, so why should you care? Uh, one big thing, public clouds are really expensive. Um, I, I went and looked the other day uh, on EC2, and, and this, you know, add, add quite a bit of fudge factor on this. To get a, uh, I think it was a single core VM with, you know, a couple gigabytes of RAM, if you ran it all the time throughout the year, you would be paying a little over $1,000 for the year. I mean, the hardware is definitely cheaper than that. Um, and so if you, I mean, for, for just one VM, it doesn't really make sense to do your own hardware. But if you've got, you know, either a need to do more than a handful uh, and, and have some har hardware resources available and someone who can take some time to actually set things up, it, it quickly turns into it's cheaper to, to, to run some of it yourself, especially if what you're using it for is like just development or testing purposes. So I mean, when, when you talk about the production stuff, yeah, there's a lot of other concerns that Amazon brings value to, but when you're talking about just stuff for yourself or, or just internal use at a, at a company, uh, this can make a lot of sense. Uh, there's also security concerns. Um, there, when you're using a public cloud provider, you are handing a lot of things over to them. Um, now, I mean, there, there are things you can do to protect yourself, but I mean, when you think about it, they're, you're running a VM on their hardware and they have control of the hardware. And so, I mean, even if you want to try to do, say, encrypting the disks, the virtual disks from your VM, they they still have access to your memory if they really wanted to. 
So, it, I mean, if you've got the stuff or any kind of data or whatnot that you absolutely cannot risk someone else getting a hold of, a public cloud might not work for you. And so, but... So are you saying this stuff applies to OpenStack or...? So why you, why you should care about OpenStack versus using a public cloud service. Oh, oh okay, so, so this, these are all attributes of open clouds but not necessarily of True, true, yes. You could, you could apply these same things to Cloud Stack or Eucalyptus or anything else. So, uh, it might be that you need more control than those systems provide. Um, yeah, I mean, if you talk about working with AWS, you kind of got to fit in there the way they do things. And if you want to do something different, it can get a little hairy. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the open source thing. <laughs> Because you can, and, and it's, it can be fun. I mean, um, if we're here at the conference, there's a good chance that we're geeks and like to do things ourselves. And so, uh, gotta have that up there. So, um, how does Nova fit in? Well, Nova is um, one of the software projects. Nova is the code name for OpenStack Compute. This is the, the virtual machines as a service software component. Uh, it, conceptually, it's very much like Amazon EC2. Uh, it was started uh, as part of the NASA Nebula project. Um, in fact, the I believe he was the CTO. Um, Chris Kemp uh, was a CTO at NASA at the time when this got started, and he has since gone off or left NASA and is the founder of Nebula, which is a uh, OpenStack uh, integrator slash hardware company. So, um, it started out as a very big, or it had a lot of stuff that it did itself, and a lot of the, the parts have slowly been migrating out to different OpenStack projects, such as the network stuff has been going into Quantum, uh, the block services have been moving into Cinder. So, um, there are a lot of uh, components to Nova. Uh, Nova API, Nova Scheduler, Nova Conductor, Compute, you gotta have a database, you gotta have some kind of message bus. Uh, there are some optional things. You don't have to use Nova Network, you can use Quantum, you, or the other way around. You don't have to use uh, Swift, which is um, the object store as a service, uh, which is kind of like uh, Amazon S3, uh, API compatible with Amazon S3 even. Um, that you, you don't have to use, if, but you can if you want to. But there are some other external OpenStack services that you do need, such as Keystone, which is their uh, the identity uh, and authentication and authorization system. Well, half of the authorization system. So there's a lot of moving pieces to Nova. Um, so you remember this picture? A little simple, right? It really looks more like this. Um, and the, the a couple hours. <laughs> yeah, so this middle part here, this is Nova. Um, and you can see, I mean, you, you've got here Cinder, which is block storage, Quantum right here with the network, uh, the OpenStack image service, which is called Glance, which is something that, that often gets just kind of neglect or ignored the fact that it's even there, but it's going to be involved in just about any system you set up. Uh, the OpenStack object store over here, Swift. Um, down here is Keystone, which uh, is the identity system. Then you've got the dashboard and, and end users. One thing that I really, really like about uh, Open, or yeah, about OpenStack in general, uh, is their uh, insistence on APIs and, and using APIs even for. Uh, the web dashboard. So if you think about a, a lot of web applications, they usually start off as like some website or web application that's just used from a browser. And then later on, someone will go, oh, well, I, it'd be really nice if I could do this part of it through an API. And so they'll, they'll add into the web app an, an API for, for just that individual thing. And, and so you don't have access to everything from the API that you can do from the uh, w from the web app, and uh, you know it's it, it's such an afterthought. 
But with OpenStack, it's not that way. They, they build the APIs first. And then with uh, the OpenStack dashboard, also called Horizon, it's just another API client. So there is nothing that you can do in the dashboard that you can't do from, from the, from either from the command line or one of the, the client libraries programmatically, which is one thing that I, I think is really cool. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to show some of that uh, a little later in the demo. Um, but in, inside Nova, there's many pieces as well. Uh, just to give a quick highlight and overview what they do, uh, Nova API is the programmatic interface to, to Nova. Um, it has a couple uh, HTTP-based APIs. Uh, there's the OpenStack API. It also has a EC2 compatible API. So if you have tools that were written to work against EC2, they might work against OpenStack without any modification. Now that's a limited implementation of the EC2 API. It doesn't support all the functionality and um, some functions might have their own little twist on them. So it, you, know, you can give it a try, you're probably not gonna break anything by just seeing if it'll work. Uh, admin API, there's also uh, a metadata API. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about metadata later. Um, then inside, you have uh, Nova Compute, which is so like OpenStack Compute Compute. <laughs> um, that's uh, what interacts with the hardware to actually realize the virtual machines. Um, I've only really used uh, Nova with um, the, the QEMU KVM hypervisor. And so it just runs QEMU and KVM directly. Um, you, it does also support talking to VMware, Hyper-V, Zen. Uh, <laughs> there's a Power VM module that was added recently. Uh, I guess I don't have that slide anymore. I used to have a slide that, that listed off a lot of them, a lot of the different virtualization drivers for Nova Compute. Um, so you, you can use it for a variety of things. Um, there's also, uh, in a lot of these, there's a, a scheduler component, like right here, Nova Scheduler, Cinda Scheduler. There's kind of one for quantum, but it's, it's buried inside of these other components. Um, and what that does is whenever there's a request for resources, um, that scheduler process or plugin is what will make the decision as to which set of hardware resources to run that request on. And uh, so you need to have one of those running. Um, and that's really the highlights of uh, Nova at this point. So, um, one of the things that I've found difficult is trying to find a message sequence chart for the different use case scenarios. So like like a flow chart of what happens where as you go through? Yeah, so like, you know, as you say, if you want to uh, spin up an instance, right, then say you're doing it from Horizon, it's going to uh, call into the scheduler, so the mm -hmm. scheduler can run its filters, see which, mm -hmm. uh, which um, you like. you're going to have to authenticate the keystone, you well, talk to compute, compute's got to talk to quantum. So I mean, I don't have it on here, but but I can actually take a moment and walk through that. Um, well, do you, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Huh? Are you aware of any that are available on the web? I, mean, I, I, I don't. One place, which is some private guy writing his blog. So yeah, I, I don't. This actually just came off some guy's blog, ken.people.info. <laughs> um, so... When you get a little farther on, if we have some time, I can come back to this and, and actually walk through them. I mean, I can't write on the, the drop down here, but, but, I, but I can point those out for you if you want. Okay. So uh, how do you use it? Um, well, because of the, the craziness of that last image, it can be somewhat a, a daunting task to get OpenStack set up. Um, there are a variety of things that you can use or uh, do to uh, make it quicker to where you can just start using it for either testing or development purposes. DevStack is something that I've used quite a bit. Uh, it is a, a, turned into a pretty gnarly collection of bash scripts 
that will go through and, and set up an entire environment for you on a single box. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so it'll set up Nova, it'll set up Keystone. Um, Install the OS and everything? Or? No, so, so it, it runs on an Ubuntu or Fedora box. Um, oh, it's the, a relatively recent Ubuntu or Fedora. Like, I think they only support Fedora 16 and 17, maybe 18. Uh, on Ubuntu, you probably should have at least 1204. Um, it does not work on. CentOS or RHEL, you know, those derivatives. I, I tried that and it was epic fail. Um, I, there was a presentation I watched a couple weeks ago that, that said that DevStack is very opinionated, uh, which I think is a very good description of DevStack. It, it has, you know, it, its way that it wants to kind of set things up and it does give you some some ways to configure that, but I mean it's it's very much meant as a quick and dirty run it on your own system to get everything set up so you can start playing with it. So um, makes for good developer test environment. Do not use it for production. It, it it makes some terrible assumptions that you would not want to use for production. Um, you can actually use it to set up a multi-host environment. That one's a little harder to do. I have done it. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, at least not for getting started. Uh, there's also Stack Ops, which uh, it's more of a, a all-in-one dis uh, Ubuntu-based distribution. Uh, so with them, you go to their website, you can download a, a OS installer, and also through their website, you can use this tool to describe what you want your environment to look like, and they'll generate configuration for it. Um, and including the OS and everything. Yeah. So it's an Ubuntu-based thing. You 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 drop you know, your CD or ISO, and uh, it has a you know install with Stack Ops. I haven't used it in a long time, so it's probably changed a bit. Um, but it's supposed to be a, a easy way to do everything from the bare metal up. So uh, if you don't care about hosting it yourself and just want to kind of start experimenting with things, uh, there's the Ubuntu and SUSE Cloud. I haven't tried either of those myself. Supposedly they're just plain open stack. I can't speak too much to them otherwise. So Ubuntu Cloud, is, is that provided via Canonical or something? Yeah, it's a, it's a service Canonical's running. And is that, do they have a free version of that to experiment with? Uh, I don't know. I actually have not gone looking at it myself too much, so I, I won't speak any more to the features it provides because I just don't know. Uh, config management system of your choice. Um, there are people who have written Chef recipes, Puppet recipes, Salt recipes, um, a variety of things. So you could probably find stuff for whatever your config management system of choice is to set things up. Uh, I don't know how how much the configuration those things do for you. Um, so that's something to research. And, and, can you help me with config management? Sorry if I'm a newbie. But you're talking about config management as setting up how mail works on the Ubuntu and how. So, config, so, so um, I'm thinking something like Puppet or Chef. So with both of, with, with Puppet or Chef, what you'll do is you'll describe what you want your system to look like from you know the operating system on up into the applications and then uh, Puppet will go through and take that description of what you want your system to look like and actually do everything yeah do everything to realize that Including that configuration uh, yeah I believe so I, I, have, I haven't tried it myself huh? That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So things along along those lines. Okay. Um, Dell, I didn't mention this one, but Dell wrote a, a, a system called Crowbar for deploying whole systems. Uh, and they wrote Chef recipes for deploying OpenStack with it as well. So that's another thing you go look at. Uh, and then finally, docs.openstack.org slash install if you're rather ambitious. Um, for me, I've only really done the, the top and bottom on this list. 
I've used DevStack and then I've actually gone through and, and done the actual install. Um, which actually isn't too bad um, with, uh, you know, recent versions of various distributions. They include all the packages or all the software packaged for you. So getting the software on your system is just a matter of, you know, using your package manager and installing the, the, the software. Um, the hard part is configuring it, um, which actually isn't too bad anymore. Uh, I would say the hardest part is just getting Keystone set up with the users and tenants and roles that it has. But there, there are things out there to help with that too that, that can just automatically generate a bunch of those for you. The, um, the install guides now actually have scripts that you can cut and paste on the uh Oh, really? Mailing list. Someone just released a new one for uh, Folsom. I think it was just uh, recently. So hmm. you go through and cut and paste all their data, and really all you want to do is uh, change your public IPs. Yeah. They have any scripts. Yeah. So uh, there, I mean, there is a lot of stuff that you can copy and paste to go through. Um, Hastexo, which is a, a, a services company for open source software. Uh, they have a, a decent install guide as well for, for setting everything up. So what was that one, I'm sorry? Hastexo, H-A-S-T-E-X-O, I think. H-A-S-T-E-X-O. -E it was, it's a couple guys that came out of Linbit. They decided they wanted to get out, stop, or wanted to do something besides DRBD. Uh, and so they, they're, it's a, uh, services company and they focus on high availability for open source projects. But they've also they've been doing some they, they released an install guide for, for OpenStack that's somewhat decent. Watch one of them is gonna watch the video now and go, ah you said it all wrong. But whatever. So uh now we'll get on to actually how uh, to use it. Let's see we just got oh, some time still, okay. So uh, to start off with, I'm gonna go through some terms and concepts uh, for, for OpenStack. First, um, some high level things, uh, and these are actually from Keystone. Well, I guess they're, they're global throughout the project, but these are managed by Keystone. You have a user, which is the thing making a response. Uh, oftentimes that thing will be you, uh, but it could be an application. Uh, a tenant or project. Uh, those ter two terms are used interchangeably a lot throughout documentation and code, uh, but that is a collection of users, instances, uh, images, etc. Um, then you have a role which defines the permissions for a user on a particular project or tenant. Um, one thing to note that I, I don't know how much this is a problem for other people, but uh, where I'm at, we've uh, at Adaptive Computing, we, we wrote a uh, you know, VM management system, and uh, we just did ownership based on users. And so, a, a, when a user creates a VM, that they're the person administering that VM, and, and another user can't see it. Um, but with this, VMs are owned by the the project, and so anyone who has access to that project can see any of the VMs in there. So. Um, yeah, it's it's like a virtual hard disk. It's it's oh. you know the the operating system with which I actually uh, next slide. Uh, it's a pre-made virtual disk image. Uh, it should have something to configure the system whenever the system, whenever the VM starts up. Uh, one very common system and was kind of turned into a de facto standard is CloudInit, which was written by Canonical. Um, and this will, at startup, uh, look at any configuration that might have been specified through external sources and apply that configuration to the system. Um, you do want to include in there the, the appropriate virtual hardware drivers and system configuration. Um, so for example, if you, you can run a Windows VM inside OpenStack, but if you're doing, uh, say, the, the KVM virtualization, uh, it uses the, or OpenStack by default uses the vert.io uh, network and block drivers. 
So you'll want to install those drivers into your Windows image before you try to run it on OpenStack. Otherwise, Windows is going to lose its brains because it can't figure out how to mount your hard drive or connect to the network. Um, it does support multiple formats for uh, your images. Um, and also, you, so these are owned by the project. Uh, anyone who has access to that project can, can launch that image. Um, but you can also specify them as public or private. So if you want anyone to be able to use your image, you can just say, this is public, and then anyone can use it. And these are the images stored in Glance? Yes. Yeah, they're stored in Glance. Which, well, so Glance can or cannot store stuff. It depends on how you configure it. You can uh, have Glance just use Swift for the actual storage. Okay. And so it's just a proxy in that case. Or you can have it right to the local, to its local disk and whatnot. It depends on how you configure it. But, okay. but yeah, uh, as far as Nova concerns, they're, they're coming from Glance. So uh, next, there's an instance type. Um, this is, a, again, a concept very similar to EC2. Uh, they also call it a flavor throughout uh, the code and documentation. And this is just your, your hardware definition for the virtual machine. It says how many vCPUs, how much memory, uh, the amount of swap, the amount of ephemeral disk that you get, etc. cetera. Uh, any other hardware-related specifications? You, I mean, there's, there's a way where you can define all kinds of hardware uh, or aspects of your virtual hardware, but then you might need to write something to actually go realize that. Yeah? So, um, I mean, depending on how you're using it and the hardware that you actually have, the reality is if you have multiple nodes in it, if you're, especially if you're mm -hmm. growing a company, um, you don't have the same hardware. Yeah. So potentially the, the I guess the flavor can vary widely depending on how strictly you follow the physical hardware compared to the virtual hardware. It potentially could, um, but by default, they keep it very generic. Um, so you, it's just really you get a, a virtual machine that's got some disk attached, which is you know just some files on the host. Uh, you've got a network interface, which they, they have a bit to, to realize that, but again, that doesn't matter what network interfaces are on your host. It's just, you know, an Ethernet interface. Um, and, you know, you, you're talking IP for a lot of the services. So as long as you've got a generic x86-based system, uh, most of this stuff should, should just work on varying hardware. Which, you, I, guess, I guess my question is, uh, I work at Bluehost, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem that we have is uh, quickly we're running into uh, many multiples of variants in the the hardware or the the images, uh, the flavors that we have. Mm -hmm. Do you know of a uh, system that allows it to be? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I can't even really say module. Like I, I don't even know how how they would implement. I'm just wondering if there's variants besides just saving. Here's the entire hardware for just this one flavor, and then say one guy wants uh, two gigs more memory. I, I don't know of a way to arbit arbitrarily change any of the values of what it specifies. So it's, it's pretty mm -hmm. hard to code it into. Yeah. Um, Isn't that what uh, filters are used for in the scheduler? So the filters will make sure that there are resources available, but it, the filters don't define the, the request at all. So this is used for defining the request and what the, the virtual hardware looks like. Um, so yeah, I don't know of anything to, to let you just arbitrarily define things, which is also a bit of a problem for my company because we deal with arbitrarily defined things. And so it's uh, with some of our software, we've had to make some changes to, to kind of restrict it like this. Um, and I don't know if I see that changing. So it's. I mean, if you think about it, it it's kind of meant as for for service providers by by allowing people to to define all these arbitrary things, it complicates uh, your operation stuff a lot. Um, so, I mean, if you're purchasing a, a ton of hardware, you want to standardize that as much as possible, and if you can, on that standardization, also have a a few 
standard choices for the hard or for the VMs, then it's it's easier to, to pack those in and plan the capacity and whatnot. So I, yeah, agree. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I, I I know what you mean. I I just don't have a, an answer for for how to change it. Uh, the last major concept to talk about is an instance. This, this is the actual realization of a virtual machine. Um, it's an instantiation of an image in an instance type. So uh, optionally, a user can specify additional um, user data and metadata. Those two pieces of, you can define arbitrary information in there. OpenStack doesn't care what, those, what they are really. On the metadata, it does care that it's a key value pair uh, in string form, but for user data, it just treats it as you know up to a 16K blob of data. And uh, OpenStack will then make those available to the, the VM so that it can query those and do different things on those. So cloud init uh, that I mentioned earlier it, uh, as they, a startup configuration piece it will actually look at the user data and pull any configuration items from the user data that the user specified and actually go through and configure those based, configure the system based on those. Um, wow, I can't believe I have user and metadata on that slide twice. Oops. Uh, so with the VMs, there's not really a shutdown of the VM. You can terminate the instance which just gets rid of it. It's no longer in the system, no longer tracked. Um, you can also pause or suspend, which are basically suspend a RAM, suspend a disk equivalents, but there's not really a, like a shutdown and, and startup from the API. So um, you probably could just do, you know, pseudo power off inside the VM and get it back up later, but I've never tried that, so. And a few last terms, security group, key pair, floating IP, network, volume, snapshots. Uh, so a security group you can uh, easily equate to a set of firewall rules uh, for your virtual machine. So um, OpenStack compute will, will, well I guess OpenStack will, will set up a bunch of firewall rules. Uh, it has a default deny by default or, uh, for everything. And these are just you know, sets of, okay, allow port 22 from this range or allow 80 from this other range. And you can then combine those together and it will do the, the firewall from the outside so you don't have to worry about it inside the, the VM. Uh, key pair is just an SSH key pair. So uh, OpenStack can keep track of your SSH public key and um, make that available to the virtual machine so that it can automatically at start time uh, put your public key in the right location so that you can SSH in without a password. Uh, floating IP address, so this is, uh, by default, you normally get VMs that are on a private network that's not routable. Um, and then floating IPs are uh, like one-to-one -one NATs that give you a way into the VM from the outside. No, they are one-to-one -one NATs. It is, I mean, it, yeah, pretty sure it's just doing that directly in IP tables. So, uh, networks, uh, exactly what it sounds like. Volume is uh, the persistent block storage. So how I said with the, the instances, when you delete one, all the virtual disks go away. Well, it's really bad if you've got data that you need to keep around. Um, so volumes are persistent block devices uh, that you can attach to instances to use for persistent storage. So there was a mention of a LAMP stack earlier. Uh, so like your, your MySQL database, you wouldn't want to store on your ephemeral storage. You would want to store it on a volume uh, that you can you know, move around. Uh, finally, snapshots are basically what they sound like. All right, so demo time. Um, Let me uh, get a terminal here. Oop. Wow. Come here, mouse. 
Actually, wait a second. I don't want to start in the terminal. I want to start with a web browser. So this is uh, my company's internal OpenStack environment. Um, so I'm now going to have more people outside the company that have seen it than people inside the company. Because it's only been set up in the past month or so. So, so basically, this is a set of computers in Open Adaptive Computing Data Center, and you install an OpenStack instance on that. Yes. That so I, w I went through, I, I installed the operating system on them. I, uh, I would rather not go into it since it's a company internal thing. Okay, but, but in general most people install OpenStack on Ubuntu? Yes, there, I, I would say by far the com people out there you install on Ubuntu. Okay. Um, from the presentation that some people from Bluehost did yesterday, I'm guessing that they're using some form of Red Hat, but it does work on multiple things. There are people who install it on, on you know, Red Hat, CentOS, Scientific, you know, you that whole family. Set, well, well, no, DevStack doesn't work on it. OpenStack as a whole does, but DevStack with its opinionated view of the world doesn't work. Yeah, that, that's an important clarification. It's yeah. not OpenStack that doesn't work on CentOS, uh, it's DevStack. I, I have installed uh, OpenStack on CentOS from scratch using the, the package manager and then just configuring everything, and that does work just fine. Um, so yeah. So this is uh, the, the web UI. I, I have made several uh, customizations to the appearance of it. Uh, if you just install it, it won't look too far from this. It's mainly just images and colors that I changed. Wait, what happened here? Sign in. There we go. So uh, I have this particular user I just created it and it's set up as just a member of this IT project, which is for me right now what I do most of my stuff in since I am in IT. So, so uh, basically you just log into OpenStack Management Console? Or this, is, this is the dashboard, uh, codenamed Horizon. Horizon, that's okay. Yeah. So this is what it looks like. Um, you can see along here multiple different things. Um, so when you first set up an environment, one of the first things you're going to want to do is add or import a key pair so that you can SSH into your VMs. Um, for example, if you, if you uh, get the Ubuntu VMs off of Canonical's website, that they, they regenerate uh, images for EC2 that you can also use on OpenStack at least every week. Um, those, there's not even password authentication that you can readily use. So you, you need to get a SSH key pair set up. So we're going to go and come in here. Um, and I have just made a, uh, I don't want to use that one. Let me come back over here. I just made a, a key pair on my my laptop here, which is this is just a, an SSH public key. You can just cat your .idrsa.pub file and just put the contents in here. Uh, give it a name, import key pair. So it gives you the fingerprint, and um, when you make requests in the future, uh, you can optionally specify a key pair for. Uh, a, uh, a new VM to use. Uh, there's several other things in here. I'll, I'll show the security groups, though I, I've, on our particular thing, I've changed, I've added a bunch of default rules because just about everyone so wants it. Rules. Yeah. Uh, by default, none of these are here. I, I went through and added these because, I mean, people want to be able to ping things 
they want to build SSH, you know, web stuff, uh, RDP. So I don't want to spend too much time on there. Uh, I'm not going to go over. Huh? It would have been nice to have a call that had the names that you just mentioned because top of your head unless you know the SSH. Yeah, so, I, I mean, being a sysadmin, I know, yeah. you know, TCP80 is HTTP yeah, yeah. and whatnot. A couple of them uh, I know, but most of them. Yeah, I, I, when I was doing this, I did actually have to look up the type and codes for ping on ICMP because I didn't readily know those, but I do now. Uh, I'm not going to go over floating a, uh, APIs, but API accesses would be if you want to use the EC2 compatible API, you would go in here and you know, download your EC2 credentials because the credentials for that are different uh, than just generic access. So if we look in here to images and snapshot, you can see I, I have a, a lot of images in here. These are just very generic ones that I have created for people inside uh, the company to use. So, um, oh, I need to go through and make those public. Anyways. So, like, for example, right here, I have a CentOS 6.4 VM, 64-bit, that was rebuilt on Wednesday, actually. What was it? It was Tuesday night, but it was Wednesday morning UTC time. So, I can go ahead and hit launch here, or uh, if I come over here to instances, there's also a launch instance here. So, you got a couple places you can do things. So, I'm going to go ahead and hit this to launch a new VM. I'll just go ahead and use this CentOS 6.4. There are a few things you do need to specify. Uh, in most, or if you do just a, a simple installation, the only things you need to specify are the image that you want to launch, the instance name, and the the flavor that you want to use. Uh, I'm just going to call this test one. Um, as as I go through these, you can see uh, the the specification for the uh, type. Uh, or so for the hardware? Flavor is specifying those values over here? Yeah, it is. So flavor is also the instance type. It's the hardware definition for the virtual machine. Okay. So like with Tiny, I only get a single vCPU. I get 512 megs of RAM and no disk, okay. which the, the no disk part here is a little bit of a misnomer. You do get whatever was in the image that got uploaded. But no more. Yeah. So, like in my case, this particular CentOS 6.4 image, it only has a two gigabyte root file system. Uh, and so, if, with this, I'll only have two gigabytes total of space. Um, but if I change to, say, this M1 small, it's got 20 gigabytes. So, um, the virtual disk that gets presented to the VM will be 20 gigabytes. Um, and the first two gigabytes of it will be the, the image that I put on there and um, you can uh, through various means you can then expand to, to use the full full thing or, or you could you could partition it however you want and use bit split it up otherwise so it, with this particular system with uh, it will actually resize it for me at startup to just use the full space uh, you can define instance count so like uh, if you want, if you needed more than one of the particular VM, you could say, you know, launch ten of these, and it will go ahead and create ten of them, all all identical. So in access and security, you can select the key pair here. It automatically selected the one I uploaded because uh, it's the only one there, and the the security group of default is automatically selected for me. Uh, this is something particular to uh, our environment. We do have to select what networks we want the VM to, to be connected to uh, on a uh, simple, like if you're using DevStack to set things up, this, I don't think this tab is even here. Yes? Just that you have Oh, okay. So you can optionally attach additional volumes. And post creation, this is the user data that I mentioned earlier. So in here, I can just do a, a shell script. Uh, dang it, can't type. Did you know no one can type on the same 
<laughs> so what's going to happen here is this is going to get uh, read by, by cloud init during startup and it's actually just going to execute this shell script. There are many other things that you could do. Uh, go find the documentation for cloud init on what it can do. So I'll just hit launch here. You can see it is, it's going through multiple steps uh, setting everything up. So now we give it a moment. It's now uh, in the running state. We can come in here and uh, there's a few cool things. We can view the log. This is the kernel output uh, for the VM. Let's view the full log. Uh, so I, I frequently will just sit here and spam the refresh during restart. So at, at the moment, it's actually resizing the virtual disk. That's why it's kind of, it looks like it's hung there. Another thing that's kind of cool that we actually have working, uh, though we're not going to, oh, maybe not. Uh, you can get a VNC console here, uh, so you can VNC to your uh, virtual machine. Apparently broken over our VPN. So uh, it'll boot up. In a moment, I could SSH to this IP address that it lists because we're we're not doing NATing all over the place. We actually have routed networks on our environment, uh, but in a in a just like a plain dev stack environment to SSH to your VM, you would have to set up a floating IP uh, for the VM. Uh, I am really short on time, so do we have just one or two quick questions? And I didn't even get all the way through what I wanted to show on the demo. I have a few hours of questions. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's see. Oh, let me, uh, I did have... Uh, so what can you do with it? Uh, it's great for temporary VMs, great for shared VM infrastructure, many more things that you can do. Uh, don't have time to really go into all of that. And uh, there's my ending slide. So. so so, basically you could have specified 10 and it would have created 10 instances of that. Mm -hmm. is that all, all identical. Is that all running on one box? Or is uh, they, they potentially could be running on different hosts. I mean, I, I have multiple compute hypervisors in my environment, so th they could run on any one of those. So basically that then is in tightly integrated with your hypervisor that's... Okay. Yeah. Anyways, we should probably... Uh, interface between virtuality and reality. So yeah. So uh, we should go ahead and let the other guys come in and get set up. So. Thanks for uh, listening. Yeah, thanks.